Good morning and welcome back to the basement. So a fun little project today. And sometimes I debate, is it even worth videoing what I'm about to do? But I think it'll be a fun little journey, mostly because it's a mentally fun exercise to carry out. So I have this little Harbor Freight ammunition box that I use to keep some uh, a gun cleaning kit and a little bit of ammunition and, and stuff in. But I've pretty much outgrown it. You know, these days you can't have too many rounds of ammunition, and this doesn't hold nearly enough. But one thing I like about this little product is it has this handy little hasp for a padlock. Now this is made of plastic, so if somebody really wants in here, of course they can hack their way in. But just having a cheap little combination padlock on here gives me some assurance that kids, particularly young kids, are not going to be able to get in here unsupervised. But like I said, I've outgrown this little one. Now, not too long ago, I came across this at a flea market nearby. This is a 50 caliber ammunition box, and it's just a wonderful piece of equipment. Somebody looks like stored auto parts in it at one point. It clearly has been repainted. But I'm going to be taking it back to its original use, and this will be my one-stop shop for ammunition, cleaning, gun maintenance, all the stuff that goes with the world of firearms. But there's a problem. This is not designed to be locked, and that's not going to work for me. So what I'm going to be doing is finding a way to make this lock. Now, it's pretty straightforward. If you can't flip this handle, then you can't get in the box. And so it'd be pretty simple to install a hasp. You can install a hasp sticking through here so that you could slip the lock through the hasp hole and then this thing can't move because it hits the lock, right? The problem is that there are two of these and you can get in it if you can open up either one. So if I put a lock on this end, then you can still open this one. And although it's not easy to get in there, you certainly can access the contents. Now, would I put two locks on it? Yes, but that would be a pain. I don't want to put two locks on it. So I need a way that I can tie down both of these panels at the same time. And I really, I don't care to modify the thing if I can help it. In particular, I don't want to drill holes in it. Because once I've drilled holes in it, then it's no longer... The thing is, at the moment, basically airtight, but certainly watertight. So I have an idea. I've given it some thought. So, what is a way that I can install a single mechanism that stops both of these paddles from being lifted? And the answer is, if we do a rod down this length, and on this end, the rod runs through a metal plate that is uh, interlaced into these holes such that it cannot come off. And then the rod penetrates through the plate and then tug down here. And if the, if the rod can't move, then the plate can't move. If the plate can't move, then the paddle can't lift. On this end, you have the rod penetrate a similar plate down on this end, which is locking this paddle in place. And of course, where it penetrates through, you leave a place to install the lock. So a couple little flat plates, a single rod drilled to uh, receive this lock, and we can make this a locking container without making any modifications to the box itself. Let's see how that goes. Now this is my, my <coughs> rat's nest where I keep random pieces of scrap metal for doing this kind of fabrication stuff. Uh, not all of it is scrap metal per se. This is a regular hitch bar. And if I need a hitch bar, I'll use it as such. But if I need it for its steel, then I'll use it for that. But I want some steel that is thick enough to not easily bend. Uh, this steel is um, a little bit less than a sixteenth of an inch. I would consider that on the borderline. I want something a little heavier than that if I can get it. Quarter inch plate, quarter inch angle, that's too thick. 
Let's see, what do we got here? This is, ah, now we're talking. Yeah, yeah, there's our steel right there. Uh, I don't know if you can tell on camera, but the rear plate is thicker than the front plate. Looks like we're looking at 0 .107. So, what is that? It's, it's a little bit less than an eighth of an inch, uh, well beyond a sixteenth of an inch. It's thin enough that I'm going to be able to work it and bend it um, without too much trouble. But it's clearly thick enough that it's not going to just twist and, uh, and fold out of the way based on human hands of prying and pulling. Now when you're prototyping like this, one of the easiest ways to figure out what you need to do is by using cardstock or you know cardboard like this. So I can use this piece of cardboard, play a bunch of games with it, figure out how I want the end product to be in something that is movable and floppy. And then from there, I just duplicate that on the steel. So I plan to make a piece that stretches through here, comes back into here, and then hooks right here. Yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that that will be able to hook through there. All right. So there we have the final form, essentially, of what I want to make. If you slide it this way, it will allow you to unhook there and come on off. So now what we have to do is make this out of the steel. So I have the basic shape cut out. So now we need to bend a dog leg about here that will slip in behind and then this needs to be bent all the way to a U-shape. Now, this metal is thick enough, and especially with the way I inherited the metal, it has this extra hole right here. It's going to be a little weak-ish to try to force it into a full U-shaped bend right here and not bend there, not bend there. So, to that end, I'm going to heat it up to red hot and see if we can't bend it over in a red hot state. Meanwhile, I have these pliers. I don't even know what pliers they really are. I picked them up somewhere. Somaka, Chicago. But they make a nice bending fulcrum. You know, nice flat thing. And I can just bend around this. So, I should be able to grip it here and take it, you know, all the way down to here. The idea is if I can get that spot to be red hot so that it will bend without fighting me too bad. For that, I'm going to be using this Harbor Freight torch. I have oxyacetylene over here that I'll reach for if I have to. But first, I'm going to try this Harbor Freight torch. The thing about the Harbor Freight is it goes through a lot of gas because it's a big flame. When you're heating things up, the one question is the temperature of the flame. Of course, an oxyacetylene flame is much higher than the melting point of most metals. But a propane flame is not quite that hot. But the other thing you have to consider is the volume of the flame. And this, although it is a propane-based flame and not quite as hot as oxyacetylene, it has such a big burner that it tends to kind of overwhelm the whole area and I'm betting we'll get this thing red hot without any problem. Let's find out. The edge of the vise and we'll choose a height. That looks about right. And we'll just bend it down. Alright, so I'm liking the beginnings of that bend. 
So now we will elevate it a little bit and try to pound with a downward angle to get it to curl over. So we'll try the flat part of the hammer. The cross peen, I think it's called. It's definitely along the way towards working. What I'm feeling the need to do now is to drive a fulcrum bending point in and hammer down against it. So, let's see if we can do this. We'll kind of use the chisel as a bending mandrel. I'm liking that. So now I'm going to go measure for where the offset should be. So I just held it up in the bracket, struck a line with the marker. So the offset needs to begin here at this line and finish up at the other line. We will start with bending back towards me because it's easier to do this bend first. Something like that. Yeah, I like that. All right, and then this one, I'll look here at the back. And then I need this bend to occur down in there. That's not going to be easy to do. But we'll just uh, try it and see what it does. Yeah, that's working. And then I can use this chisel. There we go. Let's try that. And so this cannot fold up if this is held back. And this cannot be removed unless it can travel this direction. And of course we will do the locking shaft such that it's not allowed to travel that direction. I'll make another one that's the mirror image and then we'll carry on. Okay, so now I have a couple choices. Looking through my stock of random things I've carried home. I have this nice big bolt from some kind of industrial application. So that can go through and then that can be drilled. It's already been drilled, but I'll drill a, a different thing for my purposes. And that will definitely accomplish the purpose. Then I also thought about using this smaller one. Um, because all we're talking about primarily is tension, and of course this would provide plenty of tension to do the job. The trick is that it's just a smidgen too short, because I would need to make this into an eye loop, give it a little weld so it's a welded eye loop, and then on this end it would have a slot instead of a hole, and the lock could go through there, that would be fine. but. I think it's just a little bit too short. So then I've looked at, well, I could dogleg here and bring this in. On this one, I left it a little extra long. And that would give me room to do a dogleg. And then my length could be something like this. And it's very tantalizingly close. But I just don't think it's quite there. So course I could use all thread I have all thread that I could just make a bolt essentially of any length that I want but I want it to look I don't know I want to do as little hacking on it as possible so we're gonna go with this one uh, I'll begin by drilling this end for this bolt diameter I'll just mark this with a marker drill through there it needs to be nice and tight so that this piece is up hard against this case and that cannot go that way. And then I will slip the bolt through this end. And the reason this end is because this one has, I left the least um, extra down here. So this head will very, very definitely, very cleanly go through that head. And then down here I have a little more slop to uh, hold against the face of the lock, etc., etc. So, So we have it where it would be functional right now drill here, put the lock on, and the box will be locked tight. 
but I'm going to make uh, one minor change, which is I'm going to weld these threads to the where the shaft is the solid 5 8 diameter. Put it in the lathe and turn it down. Because what I'm finding is it's really fighting to get through this hole. The threads are binding against this hole, this thin metal. And secondly, after the threads have been cut out of the shaft, it is, you know, substantially thinner in cross section. So by welding it up and turning it round, I will get it up to a higher strength. I think it would be strong enough but the combination of the weakness and the fact that it's binding. So take a few minutes to fix this part and that will greatly help it um, to go together without too much trouble. All right, so here it is, is having been welded up. I just literally took my little flux core MIG welder and welded beads on it to fill the threads up. And then we'll put a carbide tipped cutting tool here in the lathe and cut that down to a 5 8 round shaft. And there it is. It's actually about 605, so it's about 20 thousandths under where it had been. But it'll uh, go in smooth and leave us a nice clean place to drill. And there we have it. Piece on the right, piece on the left. Insert each one into its tab. And place the rod. And then insert the lock. And voila! The box is locked. You can't lift either tab, and you can't remove what has the tabs locked in. Can you get in it with a crowbar? Certainly but without leaving a lot of evidence of your entry, you are locked out. There you have it, my version of a way to lock a 50 caliber ammo box. And hey, thanks for watching.